My discussion for today would cover cleavage, vestulation, and gastrulation. To start off, let us define what a cleavage is. So, in cleavage, this is the process of repeated rapid mitotic cell divisions of the zygote to form a blastula. So, eventually, a unicellular structure will then be developed into a multi multicellular structure. The produced cells are named blastomeres and during this stage, the size of the embryo does not change and the blastomeres become smaller with each division. The type and pattern of cleavage differ from species to species and it continues to form a ball of 32 cells called the morula. So the morula continues its division to form the hollow blastula with up to several hundred cells and then eventually there will be the development of a cavity you call a blastocyl. So this blastocyl would have um, some amounts of water in it. Okay. So in here you will see how a cleavage process is happening within a frog embryo. So coming from um, a ball of cell, it will eventually have um, continuous divisions to form the blastomeres. Okay. So another example that we have for cleavage is um, the cleavage process happening in an echinoderm embryo. So here you will see how a fertilized egg looked like and then eventually going to its four cell stage. And then this is how its early blastula looks like. And then of course the later blastula. So the cleavage patterns um, in frogs and many other animals, the distribution of yolk is a key factor influencing the pattern of cleavage. So as what I have explained um, in our previews, lectures you all know that the yolk is actually responsible for the storage of the nutrients okay so in the cleavage patterns you will see vegetal poles which where the yolk is majority of the time and then of course the animal pole which has less yolk so the animal pole hence named as animal pole the developing um, embryo will be the one that will take that place. Okay? So the difference in yolk distribution results in animal and vegetal hemispheres that differ in appearance. And the first two cleavage furrows in the frog form four equally sized blastomeres. And then the third cleavage is asymmetric, forming unequally sized blastomeres. So, the cleavage can take place in two ways. First is the holoblastic cleavage. This is where when there is a complete division of the egg, it occurs in species whose eggs have little or moderate amounts of yolk, such as sea urchins and frogs. And then the second one would be the meroblastic cleavage, which is in complete division of the egg, and it occurs in species with yolk-rich eggs, such as reptiles and the birds. So, revisiting the different distribution of yolks, um, again, we have the alecithal. It doesn't have any yolk. The cleavage is holoblastic, and the result is a blastocyst. And usually, the model organism is a mammal. And then, we have the oligolecithal, which has little yolk. And then centrolecithal, which has a yolk at the center. You also have the isolecithal with even yolks, the mesolecithal with moderate amounts of yolk, and then the telolecithal, which has a large amount of yolk. So from alelecithal to mesolecithal, all of the cleavage are um, more likely holoblastic. And then telolecithal has meroblastic cleavage. And then... For the result, we have blastocyst for ale alecithal and oligolecithal. We also have blastoderm for centrolecithal. We have the blastula for both isolecithal and mesolecithal. And then the blastodisc for telolecithal. 
So the model organisms are flashed on your screen. So for oligolecithal, we have the amphioxus, starfish, sea urchin, and mammals. For the centrolecithal, we have insects. For the isolecithal, we have urchins and sandalars. And then the mesolecithal, we have amphibians and telolecithal for bird, fish, and reptiles. So this one or this image that you see on your screen is a, um, is a figure or a representation of how the distribution of yolks look like. So here we have the allelecithal. So you have the nucleus at the middle and then you have yolk platelets, usually in mammals. And then the centrolecithal, the nucleus, and then the yolk is centrally located. The mesolecithal. This one has a small, um, uh, small amount of yolk. And then we have the isolecithal. So there's a um, huge amount of uh, yolk in here for sea urchins. This is the telolecithal, also known as megalecithal for birds. And then the telolecithal for zebrafish. So... In here, again, you see the cleavage in a frog embryo. So first and foremost, you will see a fertilized zygote egg. And then it will eventually undergo the two-cell stage um, development. And then uh, there's already the formation of a gray crescent. And then the four-cell stage. And then the eight-cell stage. So in here, you will see that the color of the animal pole is more likely darker than the vegetal pole. And then eventually, it will form a blastula. And if you take a look at the cross-section of a blastula, it would show you a blastocele. Okay. So in a blastula of a frog embryo, there are at least 128 cells that are found in it and it the size is around 0 0.25 millimeters so how is cleavage regulated now so animal embryos complete cleavage when the ratio of the material in the nucleus relative to the cytoplasm is sufficiently large already okay so for the morphogenesis in animals it involves specific changes in cell shape, position, and survival. So after the cleavage, the rate of cell division slows and the normal cell cycle is restored. So morphogenesis is actually the process by which cells occupy their appropriate locations. And this involves the following. First, gastrulation, which is the movement of cells from the blastula surface to the interior of the embryo and the next one would be the organogenesis which is the formation of the organs so in gastrulation it rearranges the cells of a blastula into a three-layered embryo called a gastrula so coming from a blastula which has a blastocell in it of course there would always be movements of the cell and then it would uh, eventually form or let you see the different germ layers including the ectoderm, the endoderm, and then the mesoderm eventually which is coming from the blastocell cells and then a blastopore and then you will see here an archenteron. Okay. So for the germ layers, the three layers produced by gastrulation are called your embryonic germ layers. So, for the ectoderm, it forms the outer layer. For the endoderm, it lines the digestive tract. And then the mesoderm partly fills the space between the endoderm and the ectoderm. So, each germ layer contributes to the specific structures in the adult animal. So, for the major derivatives of the three embryonic germ layers in the vertebrates, let us always remember that, for example, when you say ectoderm, it is more likely um, or it will more likely develop into the outer um, parts of your body or even in, in an animal model. 
So it, in, it may include epidermis of the skin and its derivative, including the sweat glands, the hair follicles, the teeth. You also have the nervous sensory systems, the pituitary gland, adrenal medulla, jaws, the teeth, and the germ cells. So, lahat ng makikita nyo halos sa, la, sa labas ng katawan, more likely ectodermal derivative sila. Okay? Pag sinabi mo namang mesoderm, so it's the middle layer of the embryo, it would include um, majority of the organs that, that you will see beneath the skin. So, you will see um, or you will... Um, Take note of the following. So, you have your skeletal and muscular systems, the circulatory and lymphatic systems, the excretory and reproductive systems, except the germ cells, and then the dermis of the skin and adrenal cortex. Okay? And then for the endoderm, it is uh, coming from the inner layer of the embryo. More likely, these are the linings of the internal organs. So, epithelial lining of the digestive tract and associated organs like your liver and pancreas, epithelial lining of respiratory, excretory, and reproductive tracts and ducts, and your thymus, thyroid, and parathyroid glands. So, that's how you compartmentalize your um, germ layers. But definitely, it doesn't necessarily mean that the parts of your body are just originating from a single um, embryonic germ layer. So, some of the parts of your body are a combination of the ectoderm or mesoderm, or mesoderm and endoderm, or ectoderm and endoderm. Okay? So, those three embryonic germ layers could actually work together for them to be able to form a certain organ in your body. Okay? Next, for the gastrulation of um, in sea urchins. So, gastrulation begins at the vegetal pole of the blastula. The mesenchyme cells migrate into blastocele and then the vegetal plate forms from the remaining cells of the vegetal pole and buckles inward through invagination. So, the gastrulation in sea urchins, the newly formed cavity is what you call now your archenteron. Okay, this one, this part. And then this opens through the blastopore, which will become the anus eventually. Okay. So the gastrulation in sea urchin embryo, these are the key um, colors that you will use to identify the movement of the different um, germ cells. So for the blue colored ones, this would denote the future ectoderm. The red ones would denote the future mesoderm. And then the yellow ones will be the future endoderm. So, coming from this type of cell, you see here that you have the blastocele, and then the vegetal pole, and then the mesenchymal cells, and then this part is the animal pole. So, eventually, once it um, develops, you see here that um, little by little, there's already what you call the invagination process or the movement of the cells um, in going inside the cavity. Okay, so eventually you ha will have a formation of the archenteron, and then you have the philopodia formation of the philopodia for the sea urchins, and then you will have the blastopore, and then ar ar archenteron, and then a blastocele. And then eventually, it, you will form now there the mesenchyme or the mesoderm forms the future um, skeleton of the sea urchin. And then the anus and then the digestive tube coming from the endoderm. Okay, so that's how um, the gastrulation process happens for um, a sea urchin embryo. So, for the gastrulation in frogs, it begins when a group of cells on the dorsal side of the blastula begins to invaginate as well. So, this forms a crease along the region where the gray crescent is formed, and the part above the crease is called now your dorsal lip. So, it is found uh, in the blastopore. So, 
So cells continue to move from the embryo surface into the embryo by involution. And these cells become the endoderm and mesoderm. And cells on the embryo surface will form the ectoderm. So as we go along, you're seeing that there are different um, processes of gastrulation that happens in different species. Okay. So this is the gastrulation in frog embryo. So again, we have the different keys for you to be able to determine which will be the future ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm. So this is the surface view of the animal pole in the early gastrula of a frog. So if you see the cross section again, uh, it has a blastocil. And then eventually in this part, the dorsal lip of the blastopore will develop. So um, eventually the blastocil will shrink and then from the dorsal lip, it will go inside through the movement of invagination and form your archenteron. So in the late gastrula, the blastopore is here at the, uh, at the bottom and then eventually it will develop into a yolk plug. Okay, so now um, it is more definite that you see where the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm are situated in the gastrula. Okay. So for the gastrulation in cheeks, prior to gastrulation, the embryo is composed of an upper and lower layer, the epiblast and hypoblast respectively. So during gastrulation, epiblast cells move towards the midline of the blastoderm and then into the embryo towards the yolk. The midline thickens and it is called the primitive streak. And the hypoblast cells contribute to the sac that surrounds the yolk and a connection between the yolk and the embryo, but do not contribute to the embryo itself. So for the gastrulation in cheek, so in here you will see how it looks, how the primitive streak looks like. So in a closer look, it looks like this. Para din siyang cleavage, pero iba yung tawag sa kanya, primitive streak. So, in here you will see the epiblast cells that also go inside the blastocil or the migrating cells of the mesoderm. And then the blue ones is the future ectoderm. And then the yellow ones is the endoderm. And then you also have your hypoblast cells. Okay, so with the help of the primitive streak, it parang allows the movement of the uh, cells going inside your um, the or going inside the developing gastrula. So for the gastrulations in humans, so human eggs have very little yolk, and then a blastocyst is the human equivalent of a blastula. So the inner cell mass is a cluster of cells at one end of the blastocyst. And then the trophoblast is the outer epithelial layer of the blastocyst and does not contribute to the embryo, but instead initiates implantation. So following implantation, the trophoblast continues to expand and a set of extra embryonic membrane is formed. This includes specialized structures outside the embryo. And gastrulation involves the inward movement from the epiblast through a primitive streak similar to the cheek embryo. So four stages in the early embryonic development of humans. So the first one is the blastocyst is when blastocyst reaches the uterus. So once it reaches the uterus, you see here the endometrial lining of the uterine. Um, of the uterine of a woman and then of course the inner cell mass would eventually stick to this endometrial epithelium so you have the trophoblast here and then the blastocyst. Okay. and then second is that the blastocyst implants seven days after fertilization so as you see here the expanding region of the trophoblast is already embedded on the uterine lining. Eventually, there's already the formation of the epiblast and then the hypoblast. 
inside the trophoblast. And then next, uh, the extra embryonic membrane starts to form 10 to 11 days and gastrulation begins uh, after 13 days. So in here, you will see that um, the amniotic cavity is already being developed. Here is the epiblast and then the hypoblast. And then there, there's already the um, development of the yolk sac from the hypoblast. And then you have the extra embryonic me uh, mesodermal cells from the epiblast and then the chorion from the trophoblast. Next is the gastrulation that has been produced uh, with a three-layered embryo by four extra embryonic membranes. So in here, there's already the formation of the amnion and the chorion. This is already the ectoderm, the blue uh, colored cells. The mesoderm is the red colored cells. And then the endoderm is the yellow colored cells. There's already also the formation of the yolk sac. And then the extra embryonic uh, mesoderm. And then the alandua. So for the developmental adaptations of amniotes, started when the colonization of the land by vertebrates was made possible only after the evolution of the following. So first would be the shelled egg of birds and other reptiles as well as monotremes, which are the egg-laying mammals. And it is when the uterus of the marsupials and eutherian mammals are already developed. So in both adaptations, embryos are surrounded by fluid in a sac called the amnion. And this protects the embryo from desiccation and allows reproduction on dry land. So mammals and reptiles, including the birds, are called amniotes for this reason. So the four extra embryonic membranes that form around the embryo are the following. So first, the chorion that functions in gas exchange, the amnion that encloses the amniotic fluid, the yolk sac that encloses the yolk, and the alantua that disposes of waste products and contributes to gas exchange. Okay? So this ends my uh, lecture about cleavage, uh, blastulation, and gastrulation. So, thank you.